It's going to be so awkward and quiet if we don't have music going. There we go. That should do it. Hold up. I got to adjust my headset as well for that. There. Alrighty. Much, much better. Much, much better. Alright. Hello there. I'm Enviroboy. This is my channel. And it's time for some writing. It's a Tuesday. There's nothing special or fun or exciting about that. It just it is. It, that's a fact. It's a fact. It's Tuesday, September 21st. I don't know why I said the date today. I don't do that most days. I don't sit here and say the date. Maybe I should. Maybe that's a good way to like timestamp and sort of make a record of when I'm doing my streams. I don't know, man. I don't know what I'm doing. I never, I have no idea what the hell I'm doing with my streams. <laughs> I'm just a dude who likes to sit here and stream. And <laughs> it's like, I've, I've put, that's the thing. I don't know if it's, I don't know if people are aware of the f this fact, but I don't really put thought <laughs> into what I'm doing on any given day, nor have I really ever. I just sort of up in one day said to myself, you know, it would be fun. It'd be fun to try streaming. So that's what I'm doing. And that's like all there is to it. That's that that's the amount of thought that went into it, you know. I guess you can add on to it the thought process of like Oh, what program should I use for that? And so then I downloaded some stream capture software and put it on there. And uh, and then maybe the thought process of oh, what should I stream? And I thought We'll try the writing and see if that works. And so I did. And it turns out there's a, it's a small niche market, but dang it, people enjoy it. And so I just kind of keep doing it. <laughs> and that's the level of that's the level of thought that goes into everything I do. <laughs> so if if you're ever sitting there watching my streams or my vods, whichever, and you're thinking to yourself, "Boy, this guy's a real amateur." I don't think he knows exactly what he's doing. That's about as accurate as it gets. It, I don't know that it could be more... I don't know that a statement could be more true about my about my streams. I have no idea what I'm doing. No idea whatsoever. I don't know what I'm doing right now. I'm just sitting here babbling. I just kind of thought to myself, hey, maybe I should like sit and just do some blah blah for a little bit longer. In case there's anyone who's going to trickle in in the first few minutes. You know, so that way it's like, gives people the chance to come in. Because I have a decent number of people who have joined the Discord channel that I have. The Discord server. And I put the announcements there. So it's like, hey, if anyone sees that and wants to load up, then this gives them the chance to do that. I don't know that it's relevant because it's a very small community. And I'm not that important. I'm sure I'm sure the people who have joined the Discord have a million other things going on in their lives. So it's all like passing, but hey, you know what? You know what, damn it, I've been asked to do these types of things and by god I will I will provide them. So, you know, here I am just kind of killing time. I figured like maybe the five minute mark I would just like babble. I don't know. Like it's getting it's getting a little too meta for a stream here, isn't it? Me explaining the methodology and explaining exactly why the stream is garbage for the first five minutes, but I don't know. I don't know. Just kind of, like I say, I'm just kind of making it up as I go. It's my MO. <laughs> so, alright, anyway. Maybe we'll go ahead and actually do some writing. Maybe, maybe that's uh, something that would be, be worth doing here. Because that's like what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> it's what it's advertised as, right? I'm going to be writing. So let's go ahead and get it, get to it. So here we are. Hold on. Let me pull up. This is our map. We've been working on our dungeon. And we are almost halfway through this dungeon. Uh, we've been slowly chipping away at it, making progress. It's actually kind of looking nice. I kind of like this. Um, this is a decent battle map. There's it's It's simple. There's not a whole lot going on here. It's just rocks, because we're talking about, like, foothills of a mountain. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I kind of like it. I like, I like the look of it, but actually what's more valuable to me, or more important to me, is that I like, I like what we've added to it in terms of, in terms of content. 
like this first dungeon has kind of fallen together in kind of a nice way just with the kind of creative ways that we've gone about adding different elements right because I, I guess you know we're almost done with this this at least this particular screen worth of floors and everything so it'd be worth kind of going over it all and explaining sort of where we're at at the moment because I bet I've, I've kind of committed to doing this dungeon and really all of the dungeons within this particular campaign um, after the Legend of Zelda dungeon model um, loosely where the idea is that there's like a map and a compass which serve the function of you know the map giving the players you know a visual of the, all of the rooms in conjunction as opposed to them just trying to navigate and map it out one room at a time and the compass being some system that allows them to see the the area see the map or see what stuff is um, present in any of the rooms right because it's kind of what they do in the Zelda games plus there's like keys and boss keys in there now all of these terms are very loose um, I, I try to keep them thematic and at least like realistic enough that it doesn't completely trash any immersion that players are feeling while they're playing the game because that's one of the values of D&D &D is the fact that you can kind of offer a more narrative I don't want to use it I, I always am shy about using the term realistic because we're talking about a magic land with wizards and shit and people who sing songs to make people go insane and everything um, although I guess that's kind of real, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna open up that can of worms because it's a really good way to start an argument about what is good and not good music, and I don't really want to turn this into that kind of stream. Um, but you understand what the fuck I'm saying? Like it's not realistic isn't the, isn't really the proper term, but there is sort of like a sense of a sense of internal logic is maybe the the way to describe it within a D and D game, so that players can sort of put themselves in the shoes of their of their character and feel a sense of like predictability maybe is a good word for it um, to understand and, and see this as something that if they were to be their characters living in this world it would be a real experience not a I'm clearly a character in a game type of experience right that's like the value of doing D&D &D over playing Skyrim well one of the values there's a million values of doing it both both have their values but where was I going with that like yeah fucking most most rambling TED talk you've ever been to here um, oh yeah so so you know because we want to try and maintain that sense of immersion and and cohesion with themes and not have everything just be an obvious game mechanic right we don't literally put a compass in the map right we just put some system that allows something that makes sense within the context of this dungeon this location so that players can get some idea of what's in the rooms right and and we've kind of just by going through and putting this and piecing this dungeon together one room at a time we've kind of come up with some clever things for all of that with the map being in this room right it's just an elevated plateau that's why our pathways to it are different and so if players take the time to scale up this sort of steep hill slash cliff type place they can get up there and they have access to a bird's eye view of the area so there's not literally a map but players can kind of gain the same benefits by their characters being up there and seeing the whole the whole place um, you know and then with our keys rather than it being a specific like explicitly a key because why would there be a key in an outdoor mountain pass like who's just putting random doors that you could just walk around to the other side of the the hill um you know that wouldn't make any sense and so the keys here are scattered around we can kind of see them if we zoom in are scattered around we have like grappling hooks and different climbing equipment so that players can like gain access to difficult to enter rooms not by unlocking them literally with a key but rather by having a key item quote 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 that helps them navigate the area so it's like just by, by, by kind of trying to be creative we've come up with these things that add that that have kind of thrown together I'm, I'm actually pretty I'm like I say I'm really pleased with how this dungeons turning out because they throw in a lot of complexity without having to resort to uncreative 
uncreative forced blockades right like it just it's kind of turned into what could at least within the realm within the within the realities of D&D &D, be an expected predictable normal place so um <laughs> hey, hey Prince John John I'm glad you like the titles yeah I I don't know it's like if I got to do one every time I want it to be interesting and we've got the puns going for the video game streams so I figured hey let's do some alliteration for the writing streams that's a good warm-up writing uh, exercise get my brain thinking about like the Saurus type stuff so I, I appreciate your appreciation <laughs> But yeah, yeah, so so just, you know, to put a cap on this, like I say, this this rambling, non-interesting TED talk about what we've done so far, I'm really pleased with how this dungeon is coming along because it's feeling like a complex network of things for players to do without it feeling like some, ra like some, some forced game mechanic thing that just doesn't really feel like it belongs. Like it doesn't, it doesn't feel like it's going to be exceptionally jarring to players. It feels like a realistic uh, difficult terrain type of environment um, and I'm, I'm quite pleased with how it's turning out so um, I guess without further ado we should just like like fucking finish it because I'm sitting here um, yeah let's pull that up so yeah um, we're on room 9 we can come up with room 8 so we need to come up with a medium battle we need to come up with an enchantment token which is always fun I love the enchantment token uh, mechanic that that I play with my players. It's a homebrew thing that I've done, um, and to me, to me, it makes it a, a lot more interesting. Well, not I guess I shouldn't say more interesting. It's more like it gives players the opportunity to really, really double down on the flavor of their character that they, that they wanted to in terms of like aesthetic items, weapons, things that they use, preferred methods of, of attack and defense and stuff like that. It like it offers the opportunity for them to improve their gear and therefore their adventuring prowess um, without having to sacrifice the aesthetic that they originally had in mind for their characters. So that'll be a fun one. We can throw that in there. We'll start with that. And then we gotta just describe what the compass is gonna be. The compass. As as my as my childish mind likes to pronounce it, it's got the word ass in it. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, well, this guy's like eight years old, isn't he? Like, almost, almost, not quite. And I would appreciate you not insulting me by saying that I'm older. <laughs> saying I appear older than I actually am. That's not true. I'm like thirty, but whatever. No one cares. All right. Um. Oh wait, hold on. There's one thing I've got to do here. Um, I uh, just need to put that in there. Slide. It's important. Wait, hold on. Why? Why are we not? Key. Why is it? Oh, I know exactly why it's doing that. It's because we have the um, the A there. Hold on. Oh my goodness gracious! What a what a complicated, sticky situation I found myself in. There we go. I figured it out. Word processing tools are weird. Okay, so we got to come up with a meeting battle. Um, not that hard. Uh, so we've kind of predetermined how. Uh, why am I scrolling up? It's right here. We predetermined what sort of um, experience distribution there ought to be for any difficulty of of combat that we're presenting our players in this dungeon. Um, and there's a really long convoluted system that I've come up with that probably only works for me and the way I make my games, but. The, the, the short of it is we need to have 155 experience worth of enemies uh, for, 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 the, for, for the slaughter here for the players. Um, and that's, that's just what it comes down to. It's easy enough. Um, mid, mid, medium battle here. Um, I've, I've kind of talked about it, and I suppose I can just kind of like, as I'm going through the mechanics of it, sort of give the Cliff Notes version of it. Um, essentially, the way I break it up is within a dungeon, within a given dungeon, because I designed every dungeon for like I have I, every dungeon that I make is designed with a specific average p player level in mind, uh, assuming a five-player um, campaign because that tends to be a pretty good mid-range. Most campaigns are within a player or two of five players. 
Um, so it's all designed to be like that way. It's designed so that the players can all start off at the beginning of whatever that level is. In this situation, it's level 2. They can start off at the beginning of level 2, and by the end of it, as long as they've done everything that's available to them in the dungeon, they will then be level 3 by the end of it, um, is, is how I design it. And then I split up, I divvy up the experience points necessary for that to be accomplished within the dungeon based on how many room sets um, and battles are going to be within the dungeon. So this one's got two sets of rooms. We divvy it up. Basically, I break it for, for two, two sets of rooms. I break it up into three portions. One portion of that, ex like one third of that experience is going to be in the first set, two thirds of it in the second set. And then from there, I further divvy it up based on easy, medium, and difficult battles. Um, and and it's, uh, the, the, way, the reason I do it that way is I like dungeons to start off feeling manageable and as players go through it, I like them to start feeling the pressure. One, because they've, they're starting to use up their tools. And two, because the combats and the challenges are becoming more dangerous as they go. And the reason I like setting it up that way is... I talked about this actually kind of at length uh, yesterday. I want my players to be able to feel their growth as they go. So I want them to have the opportunity to... Once they're level five, say, and they reach the next portion of their adventure, I don't like it to immediately be challenging for level five players, because if it's always like that, then it, I feel, I, I find that players tend to start feeling almost frustrated because they, they are gaining all these powers, but they're never really gaining a leg up for it, right? Their enemies are always keeping up with them. And to a degree, you want that, obviously. You don't want the game to get easier as they go on. But the flip side of that is, is what is the point of becoming the world's most powerful level 20 wizard if you never get to flex that muscle in any way, shape, or form? So I like my dungeons to start off easy so they have that opportunity to flex and play around and practice with their new abilities, their new weapons, their new whatever they've found. It starts off easy so they can flex that. And then it gets more difficult because it's like, okay, you've had the chance to play with it. Now you have to use it responsibly. You have to be intelligent about how you use it. You have to be creative. You have to work. You know, you have to work together as a team. You have to do well. It's also that same concept. Is kind of the same reason why I pre-decide at the beginning of a dungeon what the four or five enemies are going to be in that dungeon, and then I stick with them. Like I stick with those the whole way. So it's like the first time when they're just goofing around and playing around, the battles will be easy. So they can kind of just like goof around, experiment a little bit with those enemies and it not be a deadly scenario for them. And that gives them the opportunity to learn, oh, these enemies are weak to this or resistant to this. If we do this tactic, it'll work best against these enemies, so on and so forth. So then as the battles get more difficult later on in the dungeon, they start sort of understanding and can be more direct and intentional with their attacks. So it's like... I'm trying to, basically what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to build into each dungeon a progression of, you know, being able to be creative and playful and have it not be deadly so that they can play with enemies as well as their new powers. And then by the end of it, they've turned themselves, they've sort of gone through the learning process and become effective warriors within that dungeon. And they've started to understand how it goes, you know, and that's, and that's a, the type of mechanic that exists in uh, most games, really, or at least most good games, right? A, a well-designed game is one in which your entire dungeon, they'll provide, like, a new tool for you or whatever, you know, and you, a new tool, a new ability or something like that, and so you can, you can practice using that ability, and then by the time you get to the boss, you understand that new thing they presented to you in the game, and then, you know, by, by then you're an expert at it, and that's how you use it, and that's the key to beating the boss. So it's like, as long as you're learning and paying attention, the dungeon itself will teach you and give you the tools you need. And so I try to emulate that a little bit. Hey, Enforce Round, things are going pretty well for me. Things are going pretty well. Thank you for asking. Hopefully, hopefully the same can be said for you. Um, but that's, that's the short of, I guess that wasn't really super short cliff notes, but, you know, that's the short of why my dungeons are organized the way they are and I'm not claiming that that's the best way to do it or the only way to do it um, it's just that I find with the way I design my, the way I like to build my worlds and my games combined with what my players enjoy this is kind of the this is like this the, the special formula that really just kind of makes the game game exactly what they're looking for so you know always keep that in mind if you're wanting to try 
using and emulating whatever I do on here, uh, by all means try it. I encourage it. It's stuff that works for me, so I will advocate for it. But that said, every group's a little different. So if things are a little different, then by all means tell tell my methods to fuck off and do whatever works for you and your group too. You know, that's the beauty of D&D is that every game's a little different. But anyway, long-winded stuff aside, thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Um, we got a medium battle here. Um, I'm thinking... Uh, let's see here. So we need 155 experience points. Um, I'm thinking what well, we might just shortchange them five experience points. That won't be a big deal. Um, we might we might shortchange them a little bit and just do three of these like these slightly tougher young griffins here. Um, I think that'll be because they haven't had a battle like that really. They've got all the little tiny ones, the little like wiener dog sized ones. Um, <laughs> they fight those, and then we've got plenty of blood hawks. But we don't have. I guess we have for the hard bot for the hard battle in this one. Um, so I guess they have experienced them. But if we throw three at them and short change of five experience points, it's fine. We can have we can hand wave that away. Um, the the echo knight. I don't know if I don't know if you did tell me about the echo knight. Um, oh, the DM shut that shut that idea down. I, uh, I that's that's always kind of tough. Um, it's a tough call. It's one of the hardest things for me to do as a DM to shut down someone's idea, especially if they're really passionate about it. But depending on how the game is balanced, like the game that I'm providing is balanced and, and all that kind of stuff, it sometimes it's necessary. I don't know anything about your group or your DM, um, but I can I can understand the frustration too. That because like if it's something that you put a lot of energy into and you're really passionate about, it can be it can be kind of frustrating. But it does like if you're especially if it's like a homebrew type of thing. It definitely needs to be like right game, right time thing. Oftentimes, um, let's see here. Uh, okay, so we were gonna do three x, three three of the uh, young griffons here, the small ones. So this dungeon, for those who are uninitiated with what I've been working on here, this dungeon is a mountain pass on their way to try and find a tribe of um, at least not super aggressive uh, giants is what they're trying to do um and uh, uh and they've kind of found themselves in in like the foothills of the mountains and this area is pretty pretty well infested with griffins um they've kind of made their home here uh there's some hawks in there just to add a little bit of flavor but that's kind of the the theme of this dungeon at least as far as the enemies go um with the final boss uh, the plan for the final boss is going to be Mama Griffin, and she's going to be kind of TO'd that the players have been killing off all her babies and everything. <laughs> so it's like, you know, that'll be a fun one. That'll be a fun one. Um, let's see here. That's it. New group. Um, mm. Yeah, if you're doing Adventure League, that can be a tough one. Adventure League in and of itself. Um, uh, yeah, Adventure League in and of itself uh is by design much less malleable than than perhaps a normal game would be because it's intended to be like regulated and anything that happens in it is transferable to any other adventure league so it's like you never end up with a homebrew item that wouldn't work in one game but did work in another game and stuff like that so so i could see i could definitely see where a dm would be a lot harsher in what they would allow um, again, I don't know the details of it, but yeah, if you're saying it's a, if it's an adventure league type of thing, that that does add some context that makes it not as surprising to me that a DM would shut down uh, unique ideas, because um, that's that's kind of the intent of adventure league. Adventure league, like I say, adventure league is meant to be something that's like it's consistent rules all the way across, so anyone with any character that's adventure league approved could. Uh, go from any game, you know, and it's and it's and with good reason. It's meant to be so that you can do. Um, there was another someone in the chat yesterday. We were, t I think it was yesterday. We were talking about like going to cons and playing in like you know competitive games and stuff like that. And so it's like that's what Adventure League is kind of meant to be. So they have to be a lot more stringent on things. Um, but um, I mean, I, I guess what I would say if I were you is I would just create like create a bit more of a basic character mechanically and uh but keep whatever like personality flavor and stuff you want to do i mean there's still so many fun ideas that you can do with just the standard you know vanilla flavored player's handbook uh options available um 
So, I mean, if it, the other thing about it, too, is it, maybe it's just not the game for you. Like, that's totally okay for you to say, like, you know what, this really isn't the game for me, and just bow out of it. Like, that's that's totally fine. I've had players do that, and I don't take it personally. It's like, I'm I'm running a game, and I try to run it for what the what the, um, what the the group at, at large wants to do. And if there's one player who really particularly doesn't like it, they'll just bow out of that game and maybe play with us in a different game or something like that. So, I mean, that's that's a perfectly valid option, too. Trick Trickery Cleric would be kind of interesting. You could do that. Um, but yeah, like, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It's a tough one, and I'm not there, so it's it's hard for me to really make a, an unbiased, uh, you know, comment on it. But, um, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that there's a, there's a much, much heavier limit on what is accessible for an Adventure League game. Um, and if you're just not interested in Adventure League, there's no shame in saying so. I mean, I think... I think the the concept of no D and D is better than bad D and D also applies to just your individual interests um, as players. It doesn't have to be a thing where people are offended or someone was doing something wrong. It's just you know the game's not for you. You know, no different than if you had a bunch of friends that are like, hey, let's go play basketball, and you don't like basketball, then you'd be like, all right, I'm gonna sit off to the side and read a book. Like that's allowed. That's perfectly allowed. Um, and there's no offense to it or anything. So I don't know. I don't know. I should. I, for, for all the times I've said I, I can't offer an unbiased or, or an accurate opinion because I don't know it. I'm offering a lot of opinions, so maybe I'll shut the fuck up about it <laughs> before I piss off every single person in the fandom. <laughs> anyway, so our, our little dungeon here. Medium battle. Uh, just add some flavor text. I um, always add a little flavor text that I can read from, to my players. Um, and I always try to make it something that I can read verbatim, so that way if I'm trying to DM and, my, and I'm just having a day where my brain is just not working right, I don't have to try and ad lib, I can just like read a little paragraph and it offers uh, details there. Plus it also makes it easier if I ever wanted to share this with anyone. Uh, hey, thank you for the, for the follow there, Mad Dreamer, I appreciate that. I, I really appreciate that, and I'm glad you're here, glad you're liking the content. Um, Hopefully I will continue to deliver and it won't be something where you're like, oh, actually, this guy sucks ass. Never mind. <laughs> I do my best, but no promises. I'm just I'm just some asshole who likes to make things up for fun. <laughs> um, so let's see here. Um, hold on. Let me look at where the... I need to relook at the... Um, uh, oh, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Glad. Well, I'm glad you stumbled on, on my channel. Hopefully, like I say, hopefully it continues to be interesting for you. Um, we're working on we're working on like a, a long project of in designing an entire 10 level campaign um, is what we're working on. I've got a whole backlog with all kinds of vods if you ever wanted to go catch up. They're horribly disorganized and they're the titles are not descriptive at all. So it's just kind of a hodgepodge. But if you enjoy it and you want to see more about where this where this campaign has come from and where it's going, feel free to check any of that out or just hang out here because I blather on incessantly about the stuff that I'm making. So you know. <laughs> Fun stuff. Anywho, so it's going to be in this in this area here. Um, it's kind of the first easy to access area, but it's just there's nothing particularly special about this. Um, but we can kind of describe it. We can just add our description um, as you uh, begin uh, diving deeper into the foothills. Um, uh, you come across another group of griffins. Uh, these ones, uh, actually, let's make that a period there, just because it grammatically makes more sense. Um, these ones appear older than, um, uh, sorry, one second. Um, these ones appear older than, I'm going to say the ones that, uh, you encountered previously here. Um, other than the ones you encountered previously, um, um, uh, they uh, are presently lounging. Oops, not lounging. Lounging on the stone ground. Um, uh, uh, lounging on the stone ground, but quickly come to uh, attention. Oops. Uh, quickly come to attention uh, as you approach. Uh, they appear quite apprehensive about 
about your presence. Because we're working with animals, animals, I mean griffins, mythical animals, but animals in general, a lot of players uh, will, of their own imposition, add a moral qualm to just killing creatures. So the way I'm designing all of these interactions with the griffins is like they're very defensive, they don't want you there, so if the players can successfully find ways to just like animal handling slash sneak their way around, I'm giving them the opportunity to avoid a lot of the battles here so that way they don't have to deal with the moral question mark of like, oh, but we're just killing a bunch of animals that were here and doing nothing until we showed up. Uh, but the flip side is I'm trying to make sure to describe them as very like, they're not friendly. So if the players do want to just be like, murder oh wow, and just like go in there and, and slash everything to bits, even if it's a wild animal, they can do that too. There's still going to be moral question marks about it, but... <laughs> You know, it's up to them how they want to do it. I basically, I'm leaving room for them to be more pacifist if they choose. Um, it's here. You had to leave your Thursday game. Uh, moving to Friday is a lame person game. So, just say there's no D&D. Yeah, that's that's a tough situation. That's a tough situation for sure when scheduling gets in the way of a D&D group. Especially if you are part of an established group. Um, I've definitely had that happen in my life. And actually, um, I had to talk with my group and say, Hey, you know, are you guys willing to be flexible with the time that we play? Um, because uh, the circumstances in my life are such that I might have to change my uh, my evening schedules around a little bit. I'm uh, the short of it is I have been uh, pegged to possibly start teaching uh, uh, beginners Muay Thai classes at my kickboxing gym, uh, and so depending on when they want to start that cla those classes, how soon, what times they want to do it, I may have to adjust things with my players, and it's like it's a difficult thing. Especially if you've established a time that actually works with everyone or works for everyone and then suddenly you have to possibly like swap that up That's a really tough situation. That sucks. So I can definitely sympathize with that um, Yeah, so being at a game shop, I mean, you know different circumstances But the, the concept of it being a, a crappy situation still stands um, which is really the, 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 the upshot of it all is it's it's tough it's tough when you have to leave uh, when, when when you have to leave a game or a game falls apart because of scheduling issues um, and there's like there's like no advice for it you know it's just like sometimes life does that to you and it sucks you know with D, D or any other hobby or activity that you do sometimes sometimes life just gets in the way and it's a real pain so I, I sympathize with that I, I really do hopefully hopefully this other group that you're folding into turns into one that you really enjoy being with regardless um, it's that's the, the the best wish that any of us can have um, is that it just ends up being being a good situation in the end um, so so yeah hopefully 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 happy ending for you I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for it um, let's see here so enchantment tokens so now this is a very this is very much a homebrew um, system that I use with my players it's very game mechanic -y, um, very meta very game mechanic -y, but my players really like it um, it's a system where basically uh, throughout dungeons the players are paying really close attention They can unlock and find little tokens that are imbued with magic um, That they can then use that magic to to enchant their existing weapons and armor and I do this um, I kind of already talked about it a, a minute ago, um, but I do this as a way for players to be able to keep their characters aesthetic intact while still improving their weapons and equipment because I know that you know if you wanted your player to be a samurai right and they've got their their samurai sword and everything it can be a frustrating situation for a player to be like oh well this hand axe is like it's a plus or like this battle axe is a plus one battle axe and it would definitely make me better in combat but it destroys the flavor of my character being a samurai um, that's a frustrating situation for players I feel so so I've kind of come up with this enchantment token to then give them the opportunity to just like turn their existing equipment into that plus one samurai sword or whatever they want to do and they can just kind of and I've come up with systems that kind of balance it so they can sort of change and mold their equipment as they go and there's limited amounts so that things don't ever become too powerful but the idea is that as they become legends in the land for all of the things they do their items can then become legendary items that would then show up in a museum or whatever and for added joy if this campaign comes to an end but the same group starts another one then hey time warp ahead 50 years or whatever and suddenly this long lost item is something that they find 
and then can like have kind of that fun callback to it and stuff like that. So that's that's where this system comes from. Um, I use the um, I, I kind of use the I basically use the the better crafting system that um, has been created. It's kind of widely I should I should really have it written down and handy so that I could properly cr uh, that I can properly credit it um, on stream, but because it, it's not my creation. Um, but it's pretty well known if you if you search it up D and D better crafting system you can find it and I basically just use that for enchantment as well to offer up a system where players can either do the enchanting themselves or they can just save up gold and pay someone else to do it if that's what they want to do it doesn't really matter to me um, but that's what I, that's what I'm talking about when I say enchantment token in case anyone's wondering that is not a rules as written it's not adventure league friendly that's for damn sure uh, that's for damn sure um, but um, that that's what I'm talking about when I see this when when I put this here. Uh, let's see, I'm hoping to try and bring some story to it. Uh, it can't be tough as a player if your DM isn't into it. Um, but the the best way to do it as a player, this is one thing that I encourage my players to do a lot, is just make sure your character has a very clear goal in mind and just have their actions be a balance between achieving whatever the direct goal is as well as offering little tidbits and little... Yeah, you know bits of role play about how like why your character is making the decisions they're doing they're making um, You know if you utilize deities and stuff like that that can be a good way to do it as well um, So you can kind of just do that in there just by like really what it is is if you have a rich character um, That has a reason for the way they react um, Then uh, then you can do then you can you can throw that in there. Um, that would be my suggestion DM is normally story DM while the group has been doing a dungeon call. I mean, if the DM is normally story DM, then there it is. Just talk with the DM and say, hey, I'd like to add a little bit of story. Here's some ideas I have. And bada bing, bada boom. There you go. There you go. It's easy. It's simple, simple as that. Simple as that. Um, and I mean, that kind of goes for any situation. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're struggling to figure out what kind of character you want, like based on the DM's rules, just talk with the DM. Talk with the DM. Like have a dialogue with them um, and, and figure it out. Um, that's, that's the best advice I can give right there. Because um, any advice I can give, um, while I hope that it's good advice that's applicable to most games, uh, it is with the lens of my experience with the games that I run and with my groups. And as I've, as I've harped on, it's different in every group. So my advice is, you know, it's, it's I, like I say, I hope that it's good advice, but it certainly may not be applicable in every situation. So talk with your DM. I think that's kind of what it comes down to, just about everything. I would say talk with your DM. Um, and, and work with them to figure out how you can be able to play with this in a way that jives um, that jives with what the DM and what the group wants to do as well as what you're interested in doing as part of the game. That's what I would say. Um, uh, so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> trickery, cleric, thief. Not sure on gods and goddesses, though. Uh, well, if you're doing a cleric, you better start doing some reading on, uh, on gods or something. But if you wanted to... Um, uh, if you if you wanted to do like a, a trickery cleric, I mean the trickster right there, <laughs> you know, like you're trying to trying to um, uh, you know go going going with that type of stuff. Like there's a lot of trickery gods and goddesses there, depending on how high up in the hierarchy you want your deity to be. Um, I mean that that stuff's easy to find online. Uh, just do some reading, find one that fits, and just kind of start kind of writing it out. And like I say, give it to your DM, talk with them. Um, that's that's the best advice I can give. Uh, okay, let's see here. Enchantment token. Um, we can kind of let this be kind of random. So here's how I go about choosing enchantment tokens. Um, go away. Uh, so not this isn't me trying to shill D and D Beyond. I'm not sponsored by them. They just happen to be one of the easiest tools to use because everything's just in a nice little packet here. Um, so I do this, and the way I do enchantment tokens to keep things fun and exciting and interesting. I have all my enchantment tokens. Oh, anytime, anytime, enforcer. And if you, I don't, I don't know if you are. I, it's, it's growing, so I kind of lose track of who all is in it. But I do have my Discord, um, and so if you wanted to join that, uh, if that's something that's of interest to you, you can always join up with that. And and we have discussions that talk about homebrew and D and D and all kinds of stuff like that. I've got all sorts of channels. So if you ever wanted, to, like more more discussion on that. Um, feel free to, to join up with that and post things. I, I'm, I'm bad at being super active on there, but I do try to check it at least once a day. Um, so, so um, yeah, feel free to do that if you want. Um, but, yeah, I'm always happy to help. I'm always happy to help and, and discuss different things that people have going on in their, in their games and stuff. I always think that's 
those are those are fun conversations to have. It, it's 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 good stuff. It's good stuff. Um, but for the enchantment tokens, I always like to come up with like slightly modified versions of um, actual existing spells, uh, just because I think that makes it fun and it keeps things creative. Um, and I always try to have them be kind of thematic to the environment that they're in, almost as though like whatever magic exists in that environment just kind of like manifests itself into this small token that like can be found, and then uh, so you can basically take a bit of that dungeon or that environment with you is what I always like to do. Um, and uh, as far as like what level of spell to do, because if we count Cantrip as a level of spell, there's ten levels of spells. Well, for level 1 and 2 dungeons, you just do cantrips. Uh, for level uh, uh, 3 and 4, you do level 1, and you just go on that way, and you just do two levels for every one difficulty of spell, and bada bing, bada boom, there you go. <laughs> Simple as that. So basically, all I do is I come up, I, I pull up the list of cantrips, and then I just look through until I find something that seems, like I say, like that is, that is sort of thematic to it, and then I, I plop it in there, and I just kind of put a little blurb in there to remind myself for later how that might look you know examples of what that might look like if applied to a weapon or a piece of clothing um, and uh, and it's all malleable too that's the other fun part about doing it this way is you can kind of work with your players and come up with an idea that's like something that would be not too overpowered or underpowered um, but then adds both the themat the themes of that dungeon as well as sort of helps achieve something that the player thinks would be really cool for the player to do. Because um, the the other trick about that is that's how you can get some really long-term players with long-term characters, is if you give them power over what their, what their guys can do, and so they can, like, you know, be all constantly excited about their character. They don't get tired of their character as much. Use magic items uh, at all or mostly enhancement. In, uh, so I will use magical items... But I tend to stick, when it comes to magical items, I tend to stick with, like, consumables. So I'll use, like, potions and spell scrolls and stuff like that. Um, I tend to stick more towards those, so that way the permanent items are more the enchantment token type of stuff. Um, but that's not a hard and fast rule. I still will put in magical items and, like, wondrous items that have... A magical ability. For example, I think in this dungeon we already included. Let me see if I got it here. Um, item here. So item. Uh, I kind of just invented this thing uh, again to kind of have it thematic. The item is a climbing harness. Um, and so what it is is it's like it's not magical, but it kind of still functions the same. It's a harness. It doesn't offer any sort of uh, armor types of like enhancements. But when players uh, put it on then obviously they can kind of like you know loop themselves in with some rope so if they use that in conjunction with the rope then they're not likely to fall they, then like if they fail a climbing check while that's established then they won't receive fall damage they'll just like be able to kind of rappel down to the bottom so it's like I'll, I'll, I'll do things like that and I will include things like that but I do shy away from like the plus one leather armor or things like that um, because, again, I just I think it's more fun if players are trying to find ways to enhance their own stuff and kind of create their own legendary items. So that way, rather than just giving them an arbitrary, you know, vanilla rules as written, here's your plus three great sword, you've earned it at level 18. It's more like their players have gone on this journey and they have an item that is now legendary item status that has been their work and like that is that is like it, that item tells the story of what their players have been going through is 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 basically what I'm trying to encourage and I again it's very dependent on how you want to run your games whether or not that would work you know and it's very dependent on what your groups are interested what your players are interested in whether or not it would work for any given group but I have never received never negative feedback on the system as a whole from players. Occasionally they'll be like, I don't know if I like the way you've designed that spell. And I'll be like, that's fine. Let's talk about what a better way to do it would be. So it's like on individual things, like we've kind of done that. But every group of players I presented this idea to, they've all sort of after me explaining what my intent behind it is and them kind of understanding how it's supposed to work, they all do pretty quickly uh, latch onto it and, and have a lot of fun with it. 
Um, so because of that, I shy away from like your standard plus one, you know, shield or or you know, armor of ice resistance, whatever magical items are exist as uh, rules as written, and instead provide a token that can be like, okay. This token is from, like, the Ice Shard spell or whatever. If you want to put it on a weapon, then it will do ice damage. If you want to put it on your armor, then your armor will give you ice resistance or something like that. And it's like, you give players the option. So they can build their character to be exactly the character they kind of have in mind. And they can, again, tell the story of their character through their items that would, like I say, end up in a museum or something. And it just, it's a way to inject story without railroading things, you know. Um, and that's how I end up using it. Um... And I and I and it's just it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to see what creative ways players come up with when you say like, okay, yeah, you've got a you've got an enchantment token that is imbued with the dancing light spells. Here's a few ideas of how you can use it. But like you know, you understand if you read up the dancing spells uh, or the dancing lights spell and understand it, then talk to me on how your character would try to take that magic and imbue it in an item and what the effect would be and then we just kind of make sure we balance how many day how many times per day can it be used what what are the what's the scope of the effect yada 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 but then it's like you know then they come up with you know gloves of dancing lights and so it's like once per day they can like if they're wearing their gloves they can just like you know snap their fingers and suddenly like you know lights start shooting out of the fingertips or something like that and it's like a really cool fun item that's like really thematic and it becomes a really iconic thing for their character and it just i don't know it adds it adds a lot of flavor and i have a lot of fun with it my players seem to have a lot of fun with it so i keep doing it i keep doing it <laughs> but let's see let's try and think about what we would do in this dungeon so um the the obvious thing is to try and come up with some sort of like earth or like earth movement or climbing based thing because we're talking about foothills of the mountains that's the obvious one but something like gust might not be bad either we're still kind of in the foothills and I'd prefer something like gust to be more like a mountaintop type of thing but if there was ever a place to have more air element type stuff that would be the place um, so so those are some initial ideas but we can kind of look through the list and I know there's more pages we'll get there I'm just trying to make myself not move too fast things like flames don't really make a whole lot of sense Chill touch would be more of like a a a top of the the mountain type of situation. Druid craft and eh. and code thoughts not really. Friends frostbite, green flame blade no. So again, gust is an okay one. I mean, it's cantrips, so we're kind of limited. But also, cantrips cover a lot of ground, so there'll be something here. Magic stone. One to three pebbles and imbue them with magic. You or someone else can make a ranged spell attack with one of the pebbles by throwing it or hurling it with a sling. If thrown, it has a range of 60 feet. Someone else attacks with the pebble that attacker adds your spell casting modifier. Um, uh, cast hit or miss. So it's like that. That could kind of work because it's meant to be about pebbles. So it's like that could that could work, and you could almost talk about how like the magic of the area. You know, if you've ever had that situation where you just seem to be, whether it ends up hitting you or not, you seem to have been standing on the exact perfect position for a falling rock to hit you. You know, the the, the, the trickster fey magic of the environment, you know, is manifest itself in there. So that's, that's an option. That would be kind of thematic. Mold Earth is the obvious one, right? And we're talking about mountains and everything. Um, that's the obvious one, but it almost feels a little too on the nose. Um... Then again, we're talking about just a cantrip, so that could still be usable. Although, let me see something, because I'm pretty sure I put an enchantment token in our in the first dungeon that they encounter, and I'm pretty sure I did mold earth for it. Let me check real quick. Uh, enchantment token. Uh, yeah, we already did mold earth. We already did mold earth, so I don't want to flood them with it, because um, that is the obvious one to do. So let's let's shy away from mold earth from from mold mold earth from 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 mold earth it sounds like saying old earth which you know we still kind of want to shy away from because i'm sure it's dusty and gross and dirty <laughs> would you like that pun told with zero enthusiasm whatsoever <laughs> primal savagery you know with griffins i guess i don't know snapping sting i don't even remember this one uh, it's because i it's not one that I'm super familiar with. That would be why. Shillelagh. Just give them that one because every player loves to say the word shillelagh as many chances as they get. <laughs> Sword burst, shock and grasp, or the dying. 
Sword Burst. Sword Spare the Dying would be a fun one to get players, but I feel like that there's no thematic essence to it there. Um, Thunderclap, Toll the Dead, True Strike, Vicious Mockery, Word of Radiance. All right, all right. Let's go back. Um, so the two that we kind of looked at here were Gust and uh, Magic Stone, right? Yeah. So here's what I'm thinking. Because I'm planning on putting an enchantment. I basically put an enchantment token on every set of rooms. So this is going to have two possible enchantment tokens. Um, it might seem a little hefty to put two in a single dungeon. Um, but the way I figure it is if you've got a group of five players. And if they're thorough enough to find both of them. Then each of them only gets one extra ability. And because of the nature of how we do these things, that ability isn't going to be something that will even necessarily be handy in combat. It can be, it can turn into more than anything a tool to use outside of combat as well. Um, so I, I, I never find that that's too many um, because it, you know, it dilutes when you think about an entire. It can only be used once. It can, it can only be used once um, for an entire group. Of enchanting things and the other thing about it too is players miss shit all the time like if it requires an investigation check or a perception check to notice a small coin sized token sitting in a pile of, of rocks then yeah there, there's a good chance they'll miss that there's a good chance they'll never find it um, so I, I always find that it's better to provide a few extra there um, because the other thing too is like a lot of times players will just downright forget about all of the tokens that they have. Like they'll have that one that they get super excited about and that's the first thing they do. But if it's one that they're not super duper stoked about, they'll just let it sit in their pack and they'll forget about it. To which I say, okay, you know, I'm not, I'm not too bothered by that. I gave you the opportunity. If you don't use it, you don't use it. That's, that's no problem at all. Um, so since we're going to be able to do two of them, let's do on this lower level, the magic stone. And because they're kind of climbing an elevation, we'll go ahead and put gust uh, as as a later one that they can find um, in the second set of rooms once we get there. So let's let's say it's a magic stone token. Um, let's see here. How do we want to describe? Where, where am I? Okay. Oh well, yeah, we need to go back in. Where am I? What's happening? <laughs> sitting right here, the same spot I've been sitting in for ages. Um, enchantment token. Um, uh, lying. Among the stones. Let's see. Here. I'm going to put just like a little note here. Um, uh, players. Um, let's see here. If players are searching area for hidden goodies. Um, go go goodies. Uh, we'll say um, medium difficulty check. And when I say medium difficulty check. Um, again, based on the type of balance that keeps my players happy with it being like a tr like a, a challenge still, but base but like there's still a challenge for their characters to find things, but not so difficult that they feel like they never accomplish anything. Um, I've sort of just based on my experience with my players, predetermined what an easy, medium, and difficult skill check is going to be throughout this dungeon, and I mostly do that so that way if they on the fly are doing something that I haven't explicitly written down. I know what the check difficulty is going to be, um, and I make sure to tell my players that I've like predetermined all these things, and I've and I've shown them the way I structure my dungeons. Just you know, with a dungeon that they're not playing, and just like a cursory glance, I tell them every dungeon I've predetermined these things, um, and I do that as a peacekeeping measure to make sure that players don't get mad thinking that I'm arbitrarily choosing successes and fails, particularly for if there's a, a session where one guy is just having bad luck. And he fails like seven checks in a row, but everyone else has succeeded at the other two that they've done. That way they don't, there's not that sort of like paranoid worry about if I'm trying to, you know, just take out anger on them or whatever, or just like hold them down. It's like, I, I predetermine that stuff. So that way there's not just like my arbitrary willy nilly. I guess this seems like a reasonable challenge. If it's predetermined, it just, it's a good peacekeeping thing. Um... I don't know, it's, a, it's like a better practices type thing. But that's what I mean when I say medium difficulty check. It's what I've determined because it's a level 2, 1. Medium is they need an 11. Um, excuse me, they need an 11 on the check because still at level 2. Like, it's that's a pretty easy one. If players are thinking about 
what their character skills are pretty adept at and what they want to do. So if they're using their skills wisely, then it'll be pretty easy, even at one of the difficult ones. But then if players, you know, because this is level two, and so if we have new players that still don't really think all that strategically, right, then they'll then they might be doing things willy nilly, and so it can be challenging for a player that. Or for a character that isn't skilled at investigation or whatever. Um, so that's kind of where those numbers come from. And then as they get up in level, they, things get much, much more difficult because they have, you know, a lot more experience and a lot more modifiers that improve their skills under their belts. Um, so that's where that number comes from. Um, heavy, big, 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 giant multiple grains of salt. <laughs> big, giant stones of, of you know, of, of, of sea salt. <laughs> with that, um, it works for my group. Your mileage will most likely vary. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, let's see here. Lying among the stones. Um, players are searching area for goodies. Medium difficulty check. That's just a little up there. Lying among the stones is a dull... Is, a, is something that resembles a tarnished coin. Uh, if players, if players, uh, pick it up, they can feel the subtle hum of magical energy radiating from it. Um, uh, let's see here, magical energy radiating from it, uh, carved on one of the, I'm not gonna say carved, I'm gonna say etched. I don't know why that just that word sounds better for a coin. Uh, etched on one face of the coin are three small circles, and then we'll just put a few notes here. Uh, imbued with the uh, magic stone. Uh, let's see here, magic stone spell. Uh, let me read the actual literature of the spell one more time. Touch three pebbles and imbue them with the magic. W with the magic. <laughs> not the, the only magic. Not fake magic. The magic. Um, touch one to three pebbles and imbue them with magic. You or someone else can make a ranged spell attack with one of the pebbles by throwing it or hurling it with a sling. If thrown it has a range of 60 feet. If someone else attacks with the pebble, the attacker adds your spellcasting modifier, not the attacker's, um, to the attack roll. On a hit, the target takes a bludgeoning damage equal to 1d6 plus your spellcasting ability modifier. Hit or miss, the spell then ends on that stone. If you cast the spell again, the spell ends early on any pebbles still affected by it. Okay. So, we'll just do, um, uh, just some cliff notes on it, um say um one use per day um if on clothing something like um and i actually have a place in my magic section over here i have a place where i'll put a lot more detail on these types of things um but for the sake of brevity i'm not going to do that right now um i i'll i'll take care of that at a at a later date um i i tend to fill this stuff out once i'm done with like writing a campaign or something a lot of times then i'll go through a campaign and look for things or i'll just when i'm of a mood and have some free time start adding entries to this stuff um but the big thing is this is meant to be a place of reference if there's something that i go back to m many times so it's like the enchantment token for the sake of consistency i'll add those in a lot of times but a lot of the details that will end up in here don't necessarily have a place in here. You know, they stay in the atlas and it's good. So I'll probably at some point in time add more detail in here for the sake of consistency. Um, but even then, because I like it to be malleable, it's not an essential thing. And for the sake of time and for the sake of accomplishing stuff like for making a, a dungeon and, and making a campaign, um, that's auxiliary stuff that is crucial. And so I'll save for later when I'm not working on a big project like we are right now um, but anyway uh, if I'm clothing something like uh, snap fingers to cast spell on held stones or or whatever 
Um, if on weapon, um, maybe something like hitting a rock with the weapon will, <laughs> I don't know, make the stone, uh, will make the, the rock, uh, <laughs> shoot, shoot, uh, at enemy like a, uh, like a like a line drive back at the pitcher. I don't know. I don't know. Like I'm just kind of I just kind of like spitballing, coming up with something random. Like I say, just to kind of give myself a frame of reference of you know if I'm running this campaign two years from now, if I pull this one out and I'm like, oh, this is a good campaign for what this group is interested in, and I pull it out and I see that written there, and I don't have any other notes, I never do get around to putting it in the magic or whatever. You know, then I can look at it and be like, oh, okay, this is what I kind of had in mind. Yeah, we can work with that. And then just go with that. That's that's all I'm doing with that. Um, it w is certainly subject to change. So there we go. Okay, so we got a battle and we got the enchantment token idea there. Um, so let's go ahead and just fill out our, our um, room here on our map. Um, this part, there's not a whole lot of specifics or details that need to be placed here. Um, I just always do the rooms one at a time in case one of the rooms that I'm making ends up needing something very specific. Um, so we'll just do that. Um, you know, we can put like a few rocks just kind of, actually I want to unsnap that. Um, just put a few rocks just kind of like lying around. Alright, just kind of, just something there to spice it up, give it a little bit more flavor. Um, I don't know if they have just like a singular coin uh, icon in here. Let me check. Wow, that is uh, maybe money. Oh, they don't really have money. They have onions when you search money. That's useful. <laughs> the search the search function on this program is one of the weaker points of this program. I, I'm using Dungeon Draft for anyone wondering. I'm using Dungeon Draft. And I do, I do, um, I do recommend it if you're trying to make digital maps, especially if you play virtual tabletops, because this has the ability to be saved as an interactive map that has like interactive lighting and line of sight and everything. Um, and so because of that, I do recommend this program. Uh, but I will say that the search function is, uh, lacking. It does not work very well. All right, this is, here's what we'll do. Let me see if I can just like, hold on, let me zoom this in. Let me see if we can like have it be buried by, there we go, look at that, look at that. Now there's just one little gold coin right there. Bada bing, bada boom. It's right there. Players can, literally the players can visually identify it, but they're not, there's no way they're gonna know that that's anything other than a pebble. There's no way any player is gonna look and scour the map that more closely. But God damn it, let it not be said that I didn't put it there for them to physically see and metagame their way through if they wanted to. <laughs> anyway, my my pointless pride in in silly useless things aside, um, I'm just gonna add a few more rocks just kind of scattered around here. Oh, that's a little big. That's what she said. No, it's not. <laughs> Who am I kidding? That's not what she said. Not once has she ever said that. <laughs> Sorry. This is a family program. No, it's not. All right. We'll just put some rocks there. That's good. Why not? There we go. That that makes it look good. That adds a little bit of... That adds a little bit of pizzazz to that room. I don't know. It's pretty arbitrary. Like I say, it's just there to add a bit of visual appeal to it. Um, is really all we're trying to achieve here. Um, I just do it one room at a time in case we come up with something that needs something specific, like this one where we had our our crevasse that we needed to add, you know, or like up here where I wanted to put like some actual nests and stuff. You know, we just we do we we do it one room at a time. So as we're describing the room, we can then make sure the room is decorated to match what we end up putting in the room like this is the definitive description of what's in there so that way it's not like I try and design all these rooms and then based on the random distribution of what treasures exist in places that way I don't feel like I suddenly have to try and under like try and explain why there was like a campfire in a library or some random shit like that um, <laughs> you know we can we can decorate it 
uh, as needed. So, all right, so on to the last room for this room set. And then we'll move on to the second layer. Um, for those wondering, we have already uh, created our other layer. This is our second layer here. Uh, looks very similar to the first one um, because it's still part of the mountain pass, but you know, because of how we go about things, it'll still feel a little different to the players. And it'll be good times. It'll be good times for sure, for sure. So our last room here, oops, wrong one. We need this tab. Uh, our last room. Uh, we need to have a, a hard battle, hard battle McCormick here, um, and then the compass is there. And I have a couple of ideas on how we can have a compass on this map. Like I've said, I I, I'm working off of sort of a Legend of Zelda style template for the dungeons that I've kind of contrived. Um, and I do that, I, I do that and hold myself to it as kind of a, like a, a, a writing challenge of sorts, but also as a way to make sure that I'm thinking about adding diversity and sort of like networks of tools and puzzles and barriers for players to overcome just so that way even something as simple as walking through the foothills of a mountain can be an interesting fun challenge that includes stuff that requires players and characters alike to think about their surroundings and what how best to navigate through them and so the compass is meant to be something that gives players um, a bit of insight into what can be found in any of the rooms that they're seeing. Like there's a map that gives them the ability to see the whole map regardless of what the dynamic lighting is doing. All right, so that way they can have the opportunity to strategize a little bit more about, you know, kiting enemies into this, that, or the other location, avoiding this, that, or the other location, whatever they want to do to strategize. That's what the map does, and the compass is like, oh, if you're in this room, look for this type of item, you know, to give them that little bit of clue. So if they're thorough and they find all these items, then they can make sure they find all the treasures and stuff. You know, it's, again, it's a little game mechanic-y, but the way I do my games is like, Dungeons are very game mechanic dungeon crawl in nature and then that is balanced with Sessions that are like when they're in the city that are very role play immersion heavy, right? I kind of have those two modes about my games um, And players and again, this is just based on my players and what they like I found that my players really like having that dichotomy that almost predictability of like oh We're in a dungeon instance now expect things to go this way and we should strategize in this way but then when they're in the city they're like okay we're not in a dungeon right now things are much more free form we're going to really indulge in some some heavy role playing opportunities and so you do that it gives players a sense of predictability um and it helps them understand how they should strategize approaching this that or the other thing that they're trying to do based on their location um and the other thing too is it satisfies everyone because some players really do like that power game try and think about like okay the rooms are this many squares and I've got spells that have this range and I want to try and figure that out like having a very game mechanic style dungeon offers those players who really dig that kind of stuff the opportunity to flex their their preferred play style a little bit but then by having those role play segments that also gives the players that are like I'm not super bothered by the mechanics of everything I just like to hit things with my sword but what I really have fun with is trying to like you know role play step in the shoes of trying to solve a mystery or something like that so it's like when you have those when you have that balance between those two types of gameplay it, it's that's what I find is the best way to please everyone rather than trying to have every location have everything set up the dungeons they're game mechanic -y. here's a compass here's the compass tells you that you can find this item in this room this item in that room Think about how you want to go about doing that. Just because you know that item is there doesn't mean it's obvious where it is. It might still be hidden in some way, shape, or form, right? It kind of gives them that game mechanic, but then, you know, then they can leave that area for when they're tired of the game mechanics. Blah, blah, blah. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Um, but that's that's why I'm not afraid to have things be a little, a little, you know, game mechanic exploitable, even though it's a D&D &D game, um, because there are still plenty of opportunities for the role play stuff elsewhere in the game. Um, but yeah, so we need to come up with a compass. So, and, and what I think we're going to do for this, so the compass is going to be there. This right here is the quote unquote room with the map, right? And the map, all it is, is this thing. It's hard to tell from the bird's eye view. 
you know you can't really tell the depth or anything so I just kind of describe it in words this platform is taller than pretty much the rest of them um, so this platform if they go through the trouble to climb it and I always have the 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 map and the compass rooms require the quote-unquote key to access right um, in this situation what we did for the key is the the key is a grappling hook that makes it easier to climb so the locked doors in this dungeon are platforms plateaus that are higher elevation and harder to get up to so it's like they could pick the lock by just trying to climb or scramble their way up the side of the mountain right but there's a risk of failure in this situation it might involve falling and getting hurt unless they find that harness in which case oh hey you know they've got this thing but the harness has to use a rope and suddenly we've got a web of complex things upshot is if they climb up to this platform up here because of its location and it's high up they can see kind of where all the different plateaus among these hills and cliffs are and they can kind of get an idea about where they want to go they can see that coming to this room and then moving up there you know gets them to where they want to go so they want to head to the northeast to be able to reach their destination right the map gives them that idea but then it's kind of far away so they can't really see specifically what's up there so I'm thinking what we'll do on floor 10 up here is we'll give them floor 10 room 10 it's another platform that requires some climbing to get up to um, and so what I might do is I might need to add another passageway that doesn't require the key to get through there possibly I don't know I haven't decided I kind of have to actually look at what's in other rooms. I might just require that, like, hey, to move forward, you have to get the key anyway. Um, but from this one, what I'm thinking is, it's another elevated platform. This one has, like, an old cracked spyglass. It's not excellent. It can't see miles and miles, but it can help zoom in on these areas enough that they can then identify, you know, be able to get an idea like, oh, shoot, I see some monsters over on this one. And it's like, oh, over here we missed... You know, through this, because of the angle of the sun and using the spyglass, I can see there's something interesting to find over there. There's like, looks like among one of those piles of rubble, there's some sort of coin or something. You know, it's like, oh, over here, oh, geez, with the spyglass and from this higher up angle, looking into that crevasse that's there, I can see there's a little satchel that probably has something if we wanted to try and climb down and get that. You know, so it's like, that's what I'm thinking the compass is going to be in this dungeon, just like a way for their players to without having to make excessive checks and constantly search and get lucky suddenly from that vantage point with the spyglass they find up there like oh we can see these items that we've missed let's go back and get those simple as that you know it's not actually a compass but it serves the it serves the function it serves the function it's creative and hey you know if they want to keep that and then suddenly they've got a spyglass and they, they can use that in future dungeons and they're not going to be upset about that and I would not consider a spyglass something particularly overpowered because if they were in a city and they're like oh you know what we'd want a spyglass you know we'd, we'd want a telescope or something or binoculars so that way we can see in the distance that's something that I'd be like I mean hell if you've got the coin for that I'm sure there's a shop somewhere in the city that'll provide that so it's not a particularly overpowered item because as long as they got the money they can find it anyway so that's what I'm thinking for our um for our compass there now the fun part here is that there's gonna be a hard battle <laughs> so they're gonna have to earn that shit um, oops, sorry control underline hard battle McCormick um, underline there so a hard battle um, here on this first set of rooms needs 230 experience points um, so the boss here the Griffin 450 experience points it wouldn't make sense anyway like we can't fit it in there with uh, with our uh, experience budget there hey hey smart dragon wicked smart dragon good to see you glad you're here glad you're here um, so but the the other thing about it too is the Griffin is meant to be the final boss here so we wouldn't use that one anyway as you can see we kind of have pre we have pre budgeted our boss battle that will include that plus a couple other things so a hard battle with 230 experience available to it. I'm thinking there's just a bunch of griffins up there playing around, like playing with each other, romping around. I like to imagine griffins are, when they're when they're young youngins, they like to play with each other. So there's like four of these ones here, uh, the four of these small young griffins, and then three of these tiny ones to give them their. Uh, oh wait, hold on. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Nobody got that right. So there's four of these guys, three of those guys seven enemies uh, for level two players that's a reasonably tough battle I think that's a good one I think they can handle it but that's a hard battle 
Um, and it, you know, it, it fits the theme of what we're trying to do here. So let's let's go with it. So hard battle. Um, let's see here. Another ele elevated plateau. Uh, pla plateau. There it is. Uh, stands before you. Um, uh, 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 you. I I'm kind of describing what they see as they like approach this room because it's gonna need the key to it, just like the way I would say, like a locked door stands between you. Um, you suspect a challenging climb is ahead of you if you wish uh, to make uh, it up this, uh, make it make it up to the top. Um, and then we'll just add our next little bit, which is them reaching the top. So upon reaching the top of this plateau, uh, pla plateau, I know how to, wow, wowie, pla plateau, there it is. Upon reaching the top of this plateau, you find yourselves uh, face to face with, uh, with seven uh, griffins. Griffons, um, at um, seven Griffins. They are all young, though their ages do seem to uh, vary from hatchling to youngling. I guess I don't know. Is that what you call a Griffin pup a youngling? I don't know. We're gonna go with it. It doesn't matter. It's all for flavor anyway. We'll just we'll just say that I'm using flowery language and got a little too excited with the thesaurus if anyone questions it. It doesn't, doesn't matter. No one will question it. Who gives a crap? <laughs> um, ages do seem... They're all young. Ages do seem to vary from hatchling to youngling. They do not appear to be thrilled by your arrival. Boom. There we go. All right. So then, let's just add our details here. Um, four of the small griffins, and then three of the uh, tiny griffins. The tiny griffins. I <laughs> said it before. In my in my mind, when I see, gosh dang, gosh dang it! One note. Stop being frustrating. There we go. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I, I I flew off the handle a little bit there. My apologies. Um, <laughs> whenever I think of the tiny griffins, I just think of like little wiener dog sized griffins romping around barking at each other. <laughs> it's, it's, it's what's in my mind, uh, mind's eye. I have no idea if that's what they intended, but that's just what I think of. Anyway, um, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, ba, 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 compass. Oops. Uh, compass. Uh, let's see here. Lying on uh, this uh, plateau is a very old and forgotten pack. Um, oh my gosh! I just I okay. I'll I'll add the description in here for you guys. But I just thought of. I thought of something great that'll be fun flavor for players to think about here. All right, um, lying on this plateau is a very old and forgotten pack. Uh, most of its contents have long since uh, been lost to the elements. Uh, however, um, elements actually, if I'm using however, it'll be better to do a period there. Um, however, however. However, um, there is a relatively intact uh, spyglass um, in the pack. The lens is the, the the lens is cracked and foggy, but it can still be used uh, to get a clearer view. Of the, uh, of the, of the, the hills below you. Um, 
if you take your time, you get the sense that you could easily identify everything, everything um, in the area from up here with this spyglass. And basically what I'm doing is I'm doing, I'm giving them favor, flavor text that says like, hint, hint, use the spyglass to figure out all of the treasures and enemies that are up here. You know, that's like, that's the, 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 the cue, the flavor text cue that it's like, hey, here's what you ought to do with this. And I'm pretty lenient with my players if they're just like, I still don't understand what you're saying. I'll be like, D you, I'll d use the spyglass. It's your, that's your compass for this area. That's how you can find everything. That's, that's me. I'm gifting you something. Use it. <laughs> so we'll do that. Um, and then... Uh, well, I'm gonna do just as another bullet. Here's the idea I had. Uh, if players <clears throat> look to the south directly below the plateau um, with with the spyglass, they can see a, a very old and broken skeleton. Uh, it appears that the previous owner of uh, this spyglass took a tumble all those years ago. So that's, that explains why there's just an abandoned backpack with a with, 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 with a with a friggin' telescope <laughs> there. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one who thinks that's funny, but <laughs> I think that's a fun that's the type of Easter egg that I like to offer my players, and so what we'll do here, um, so, okay, so now we gotta decorate our, our area here, um, okay, one thing that I do need to do, because I want this one to only be accessible with the key, it needs to be climbed, uh, let's go to our terrain tool here, our terrain brush, we're gonna do our gravel, narrow it down so we don't accidentally do the wrong area, so I've been using this gravel terrain to indicate, like, hey, this is a path, but, like, you can't just go walking down it. You just can't do that. Right, so there's their there's their clue that like, okay, yeah, they can climb up there if they've got the climbing gear, the key that they're supposed to find. Um, so so there's that. Um, so now let's just get um, some, uh, some, some stuff here. Uh... Let's do that right there, I guess. There we go. That kind of makes it a fun, narrow combat area for them to have to navigate with all of the... That's one of the challenges of this is, like, the Griffins are there. Um, they could potentially be flying around and attacking them, but, you know, sometimes sometimes a nice, tight battlefield, even if it's out in the open, is a fun challenge to give your players. Um, so I'm not too afraid to, to fill that up. But now, skeleton. Oh, there we go. Check it. Oh, just, just a little hint of the skeleton there. Hold on, I want to make sure it's like clearly a skeleton. There we go. There's our skeleton there, so they can kind of see it. Hey, Spesh, how's it going? <laughs> so there's there's our skeleton <laughs> for for players to find. Again, again, let it not be said that I didn't, as a DM, put it uh, the skeleton there for the players themselves to uh, be able to see and metagame their understanding of. I just kind of like the idea of there just being like random skeletons among the mountains and stuff of fallen mountaineers. A little dark, but... <laughs> there we go. Alright, 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 alright. So there's our first set of rooms. Uh, and I actually am really stoked with how this uh, with how this has turned out so far. Um, I'm digging this. And I'm like I say, I'm really pleased with the level of complexity we're managing to achieve with this dungeon. Um, this dungeon being an open, an open air dungeon, right? It's not a conventional dungeon where you're like, oh, you need dark vision. Um, you need dark vision and uh, torches to navigate here. Right? It's not a conventional dungeon, but with the mechanics and the way we've described this, I think it'll still function just the same. Um, but that's what makes it really fun. This will feel just as long as I as long as I as DM when my players are going through this 
am attentive to how I'm describing things to them, I think this is going to end up feeling like a very fresh experience to players who are expecting every dungeon to be like, this is torture chamber number eight. You find skeletons here. Hey, Gabby, how's it going? Uh, yeah, so Smash, I'm using, uh, I'm using Dungeon Draft, actually. Um, not entirely different from Incarnate. Incarnate is a wonderful tool, uh, but I've adopted Dungeon Draft because of the, I, you know, the, the way, the, what I always say about it is, um, Dungeon Draft is awesome because it is designed to be able to be saved into formats, uh, into interactive map formats for, uh, some of the existing, uh, virtual tabletop, uh, programs that can be used for online, uh, online things. I'm a wonderful tool. I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm, uh, flattered or offended. I, like, thank you? <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I, I really enjoy Dungeon Draft, um, for those reasons, but Incarnate is a really good one. Um, first, first stream you're watching from your house, is that to say you have a new house? Is that, is that what you're implying? Or is this like just the first time you've watched uh, streams from, from home? Uh, I, 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 I want to make sure I'm interpreting that properly. Because if it's like from a new house, then congratulations. That's super exciting. Um, but if it's not from a new house, then shut up. I don't care. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm, I'm flattered that regardless of the circumstances, you would choose to watch my stream. I, I find that quite flattering. <laughs> and I thank you humbly. Um... God, just the, sorry, I'm sorry. I took the I took the aggression way up there. I don't know what came over me. Moved into house about two weeks ago. That's uh wow. That's that's really awesome. Like genuinely, that's really awesome. I I'm very happy for you. Uh, I yeah. You should you should do a happy dance. Happy dance in every single room. Uh yeah. Sorry sorry, Smash. The anger came out of nowhere. I apologize. I, I don't know where that came from. This is just I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't I don't know where that came from. <laughs> but no, congratulations. That is super exciting. That is super exciting. One day, one day I hope to have a house. Um, but that day is probably a little ways off. Probably will be dependent on me paying off my student loans. And will definitely be dependent on me finally, like, saving my money. Because I'm very good at saving money. But I save money for, like, things that will help me, you know, do my hobbies and stuff like that. So it's like I save my money. I'm very good at saving my money. But then I spend it on, like, really nice boxing gloves for my Muay Thai classes and stuff. And, like, right now I'm saving my money so I can get some really good training equipment because it, uh, because it's, it, it's sounding more and more like they're going to have me teaching some classes at my gym. So it's like I'm good at saving money, but it goes towards things that aren't houses. So, especially if you wanted to buy me a house, I, like, some people would be like, oh, God, no, I, I don't know what I would do. I couldn't accept that type of thing. God damn it, if someone wanted to buy me a house, like, fuck, man, I'd be like, okay, as long as there's actually no strings attached, I will fucking take that leg up. Because let's be real, in modern-day economies, in modern-day economies, you gotta take gifts wherever they can come from, and you never look a gift horse in the mouth, so. Especially if you wanted to wire me the down payment on a house, god damn it, I would accept it. I would accept it. Just don't give me any sort of, like, conditions about Nigerian princes and shit like that. Because I don't know, I don't know if I can handle such a roller coaster. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready for, for that level of scam coming from you, friend. <laughs> Just wire me the house. You wouldn't download a house, would you? Send me a, a, a torrent file and a 3D printer. <laughs> house is an RV so you can move it. Honestly, I've thought a lot about that. Like, there's something, if it weren't for the fact that I enjoy having stable internet too much, like, a lot of my hobbies are dependent on having a quality, stable internet uh, connection. I've honestly, uh, aside from that, I thought it would actually be really fun, um, it would be really fun to do the whole RV life thing. Um, there's something cozy about it. I mean, like, the size differential wouldn't be much... Uh, different than what my my current living situation in my apartment is so it's like that's true there is Starlink I don't know I feel like I want to see that stabilize a bit and be guaranteed to be quality high-speed internet otherwise boy oh boy would you guys be sad wouldn't wouldn't you guys all just be so sad if my face looked like a potato on screen because of poor internet quality I mean come on now come on now we all know you're here for the for the money maker right you know like how would you see the, the 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 glorious haphazard
kind of mohawk because I haven't gotten my hair cut in too long. <laughs> How else would you enjoy all of this? If not for... I'm not, it already appears that way. No, 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 no. Like, I'm right now. I'm a talking potato head, right? You can still notice that there are eyes and a mouth present on this potato-looking visage. But if I if I were on if I were on crappy crappy mobile inter, mobile hotspot level internet, then it would really just look like a potato. Like there would be no defining features. I would look like I would look like uh, I would look like um uh, like Neo. Uh, in the one scene where his, uh, where his, like, he suddenly doesn't have a mouth and it's just all skin over it. And my, uh, streams would turn into nightmare stuff. I don't want to talk about this anymore. I'm making myself uncomfortable. I don't want to imagine myself looking like that. It's creepy as hell. Oh, no, 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 no. You know what the look is? Never mind. I'm, I'm bringing it back up. I'm bringing it back up. Uh, because it would, the, the look is like, um, the shitty, which one was it? It was one of the Wolverine, or was it X-Men Origins? The one where they had, um... Deadpool before like the Deadpool movies and it was Ryan Reynolds but they turned Deadpool into the weird amalgamation of a bunch of them so it like they gave him like his Deadpool swords but like um but like Wolverine style so like the, the single sword came out like he was flipping you off or some shit you know and they like and they took away his mouth they stitched his mouth shut and they had the 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 groaner of a line like they finally found a way to shut you up yeah 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 especially you know what I'm talking about that's what I would look like. God, I wish I looked as I, I wish I looked half as attractive as Ryan Reynolds. That man, that man, wait, he's a beautiful man. All right. Anyway, what time is it? We got a half hour. Let's try and get another room or two done here. <laughs> Weird. Wow, that 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 tangent took some turns, didn't it? <laughs> that tangent. That was that was a real winding one there. <laughs> oh my God. This is see. This is why I love streaming. Like. Where else in my life am I going to have conversations like this shit? <laughs> God damn. I mean, you know, like with my friends or some shit probably, but whatever. Hold on. Why didn't I number these? Um, uh, let's see here. Um, now, okay, hold on a second. Is this all set up? I think this is all copy and pasted. I think I actually still need to re uh re <laughs> you're only here for the tangents you know honestly some people that's what they're here for that's what they're here for honestly that's and i like fuck man if you think my if you think my brand of humor is entertaining enough to put up like if you're not interested in D, &D but you think my humor is entertaining enough to put up with the fact that i'm doing D, &D homebrew writing stuff here and you and you still hang out here then honestly like genuinely i find that quite flattering so like you know thank you uh, but let me see. I think I think I need to. Um, is this is this all the same? I can't tell. Uh, no, it's not. It's not. I did. I did already. Yeah, this is all. This is all newly. Um, this this is all freshly. Uh, uh, distributed stuff. Cause I randomly distribute all of it. But I know I tend to copy and paste. Um, like the setups here just that way I don't have to retype out all of the room one rooms two, all of that type of the stuff I tend to like copy whatever the first set is when I just have the the framework and then I can't remember sometimes if like it's a, a Copy of the last room set and wh whatever no one no one cares. What am I? Why am I blabbering about this? No one cares <laughs> No one cares about this shit I'm, I'm what I'm tr what I'm doing is I'm padding the stream so that way I can argue that it's a two-hour stream even though I don't get two hours worth of shit done all right um easy battle here let's see here uh go back to writing uh just a short one shot but that's it's got quite a bit of detail that's awesome that's awesome uh I highly encourage anyone to do any sort of writing I think writing I think writing is one of the best ways to flex your creativity just because it requires no overhead if you have a pencil and a pad of paper you can do some writing and there's no limit to what you write you know if your form of creativity is writing sci-fi stories then you can do that if your form of creativity is creating D&D &D stuff you could do that if your form of writing is just like try just for the sake of messing with people writing some weird like horror flick version of a journal where it's just you scratching the same word like scratch like just like 
you know, with a pen, just like going over and writing mother, 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 like on, on the same piece of paper over and over again, and then leaving it in a, in a ditch just to freak someone out, thinking they found some meth head's journal. Like, you can do that. You can do whatever you want with writing. It's beautiful. It's one of the best ways to be creative. I highly encourage it for everyone. I don't, maybe I should see someone if I'm able to come up with something weird like that. I don't know. Is that a problem? I'm not going to actually do it, but you're going to do that. I, I, You know what? If you do that, I, if I see it on the news, I'm taking credit. <laughs> not for doing it, for inspiring it. I'm taking credit. <laughs> oh, my God. Jeez, oh, Pete's. All right. Um, hold on. I need to pull my key down here so we can... Uh, just easily remember how much experience to put in places. I know I could just like drag it and do this, but one note is so clumsy with its so clumsy and slow with its like scroll when you're carrying something that I don't do it. I just I just I don't like doing it. It sucks. It's a pain in the anus. Okay, easy bout. Man, I'm in a mood today. <laughs> I'm like rambling. I my volume is all over the place. <laughs> You guys got me wound up. I'm like a I'm like a small child. When when my friends are around, I get excitable. Definitely don't give me sugar. <laughs> yeah, in small print, in in small in, in small. No, that's perfect. You can just on small and in small print put Enviro Boy made me do this, and no one will know what the fuck you're talking about because there's like eight people who know who I am with my streams. So. <laughs> now that's not fair. That's not fair. Uh, there's more people than that, and I'm appreciative of each and every one of you. But if you do that, that'll just add to the insanity of it all. And people will be like, what the fuck are they talking about? And then and then it will turn into the most effective guerrilla marketing system ever because people will flood the internet trying to figure out what it is, and they'll inevitably, be, inevitably be led to my stream. And everyone will come to check out just to see what kind of madman would encourage this type of thing. And even though none of them will stick around because they'll be like, oh, this guy's boring and stupid then it'll still work. I'll still get the views. It'll, I'll still get the views. And and I have just revealed my mad scientist plan. You're all puppets in my plan to advertise my stream. It's a long game, baby, but god damn it, I'm doing it. And I'm feeling a little unhinged here, so maybe I'm just going to like bring it back in. Like Boxy, yeah, there you go. Exactly, exactly. Oh, this is a this is a wonderful time for you to be back, uh, s Smart Dragon, because you just, you just missed the insanity tirade. <laughs> I'm not doing it again. <laughs> You'll have to go back and check out the VOD. I, uh, I, I, I really went off the rails for a second there. I apologize, everyone. People just tuning in are going to be like, I thought this was a writing stream. What the fuck is this guy talking about? Is he just a crazy person rambling? And the answer is yes, but also I sometimes write. All right. Um, easy battle. Fuck, man. All right, what am I doing here? So this is room one up here. Okay, so this is like the first room they can get access to. Um, easy battle, and then the boss key is present here. Um, we're all crazy streamers. Yeah, you know that's true. That's true. I feel like there there's a certain level of of detached and unhinged you have to be to like willfully just sit in front of a camera and like imagine that you're talking to people because it's like I know there's real people watching the stream right now, or at least I trust that there's real people. It could all be a simulation. I could be sitting. Uh, in a psych ward, but like, you know, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> that is the evil monologue behind every CEO that's ever put their logo on the merchandise. And they will pay to advertise for us. Yes, that's basically, basically, Aquarius, you're, you're not far off. Basically, what I've just described is my origin story for how in 20 years I'm going to be Bezos version 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not not a robot beep beep. That's not you're not helping you're not helping my particular brand of paranoia here, Dragon. I need you to cool it with that shit. All right. And I also don't appreciate you swearing at me in R two D two. Okay. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't appreciate that language. <laughs> in my Boyzos, I like that. I'm using that. I'm changing my name. I'm changing my name. <laughs> Biggest stat block. Oh my god, that's gonna be the big bad for one of my campaigns one of these days. That that'll be my big bad for a Starfinder campaign one of these days. Like I will write a, a sci-fi epic Starfinder, and you'll have to fight like Robo Bezos, which is basically he just put his he put his brain, he spent billions of dollars 
to put his brain. No, it's not an enlarged head. He 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 put his brain into <laughs> into a Boston Dynamics robots. Have you seen that shit? Shit's scary. Imagine that in like 200 years. Like he's gonna. That's what he'll do. He'll he'll attach his brain there. No, he'll attach his head. He'll attach his head. It'll be like a Futurama head on an, on like a weird like psyops robot body just going around doing front flips and shit and it's gonna be terrifying like god damn and he'll be doing that creepy ass laugh he did like in that recent video yeah you're telling me it's terrifying i'm gonna have i'm giving myself nightmares with all these weird ass fucking ideas and tangents that i'm going on god damn you've done this you did this to me i'm blaming you guys front, front flips and shitting simultaneously the scariest combination <laughs> won't own Boston Dynamics. They're bought out by another giant. Eventually, everything will be owned by one man. Like that's where that's where capitalism. This is my this is my dystopian prediction. Capitalism is heading in a direction that eventually there will be one man who owns everything. But because it's just one man who owns everyone, eventually everyone's going to be tired of it, and they're just going to stop listening to him and letting him have power. And he'll just have his own mansion off in space somewhere, and the world will basically reset. Because everyone but that one man is broke, and that's and that's what yeah, the way, like I say, there won't even need to be a revolt. He'll go, he'll just fuck off in a space mansion, and we'll all be like, you want to just ignore him, and we'll just ignore him, and everyone will go about their business without him, and that will be, and the world will reset, and everything will be glorious. That's my that's my hopeful prediction. That's my hopeful prediction. I haven't written anything in like 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm the worst writing streamer. This is terrible. <laughs> or maybe I'm the best writing streamer because no one actually wants to watch me write. And, like, so they just come in here and they see other things. <laughs> oh, my God. Holy shit. This this took a weird turn this stream did today. And you know what? Truthfully, I'm okay with it. I'm, I'm on board. I'm along for the ride. I think it's fun. <laughs> All right. Uh, what the fuck am I doing? I'm supposed to be making an easy battle. Supposed to be making an easy battle. A battle worth 145 experience points. Um, and it's not a plan, and, and it's got the boss key. Um, and we're just gonna, like. So here's where the decision comes in. I have to decide whether I want the keys to be the same keys as before, or if I want them to be a little different. I kind of want them to be different. Um, I kind of want, want the keys to be a little bit different. I gotta think about that, though. I kind of. I'm wondering if the keys, rather than climbing to go over, we can have the keys be like mining picks or shovels or something. So that way now they have to go like through or under the the stone earth barriers or whatever. I had a right in stream yesterday. So new PC was glitchy with your drawing tablet. <laughs> it's uh it's it's a it's a particular type of uh it's definitely a particular type of stream to do like a writing type of stream. And I think the I think the thing that makes it work is I'm willing to sit here and one do that uncomfortable thing where it makes it just look like I'm really illiterate and I just like say everything out loud as I'm typing it, um, you know, like a small child trying to spell his name. You know, my name is 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 John J. O. Right? You know, it's like you got to do that kind of thing. Um, and I think the other thing about it that makes it work for me is. Because I'm having the writing be like I'm I'm mechanically creating something that like I'm basically creating a game, right? I don't think it would work. I don't. That's right. Exactly. Spell the name wrong, like little kids do, um, or acts like accidentally spell something in like a really inappropriate way, you know. So like I'm, you know, like I, my dad uh, my dad is coming over spelled, you know, coming spelled in a very uncomfortable way. The kid is innocent. And they don't realize. <laughs> The other thing that I think makes the writing stream, um, we have the back space stream, is sometimes, some days, some days. Uh, I, but if it's like, if it's at that point, usually what I do is I just plow ahead and it becomes the, and it becomes the spell check stream. Um, no, I think the other thing that makes it work is like, I'm not sitting here writing a story. Like if I were just writing a story, it would be boring because there wouldn't be like, there wouldn't be any sort of mechanics and there wouldn't be a whole lot to consider. I would basically, it would basically just be like a really, really elongated book on tape type of situation and that would get old. But because I'm making a game where there's like a lot of mechanics to think about and balance and there's a lot of different 
like like you know just like that there's statistics and and mechanics to balance the the writing is broken up with a lot of like pondering about like how do i want to present this puzzle like how do i want to present this thing um, you know, it's like, how, how, how do I want to keep this balanced? How am I going to present this in a way that will, that players will enjoy? So there's a lot of theory that goes behind it. And I think that's what, at least for me, makes the writing stream work is, is the fact that it's not like the writing is almost like the actual mechanical process of, of typing things out and writing isn't the forefront focus of it. It's more so like the theory and the process behind what eventually gets written down. And I think that's what makes it work. That and the random tangents about Bezos and and shit that we that we like we 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 go behind. A loud keyboard, two viewers just here. Click click click. Yeah, I uh, my keyboard is pretty loud. If it weren't for the fact that I'm using this tiny little microphone that's like held right up to my face, you'd probably hear it too. I I love my mechanical keyboard, but I also love my clicky keys. Um, and so it's quite it's loud enough that I can definitely hear it through my little in ears that I've got going on. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, Bezos. I, I love calling him Bezos. I, I've never actually bothered to look up what is officially the right way or wrong way. I always assumed Bezos was the correct way, and then Bezos is just like the, like, fuck you, I'm calling you something different because fuck you way of saying it. <laughs> I don't know, man. But yeah, I think that's what makes the writing part of it work, is because, like, mechanically speaking, writing is actually not the, the focus of the stream. It's it's what goes into, it's the thought process and theory that goes by, that goes into the writing. Um, but yeah, for the keys here, I think I want to mix it up because if we keep it the same, because it's not actually like a specified key that goes in a specific lock. If we keep the keys the same, then players can just use the keys they had beforehand, which then kind of defeats the excitement and the purpose of finding the keys keys in quotations right loose fit term keys so i think i'm gonna change it up and it's a little game mechanic -y, but i kind of want to have the keys be like a pickaxe so it's like now there's like cave-ins and stuff and they kind of encountered a cave-in beforehand um but it's like now there's a cave-in that they that it's going to be smarter for them to like pickaxe their way through for some reason or like maybe there's a tunnel that like is partly blocked and so rather than climbing through it they have to pickaxe their way through it maybe i'll do that way I think that's I think that's gonna work out pretty okay. I think that's gonna be the okay way to do it. Listening to an audio book for creative writing by James Hines. Is that to say like it's an audio book that like it's like creative writing for dummies, like like that type of audio book? Is that what you're saying? Or is it just like are you saying there's like a are you listening to an audio book that's like really inspiring to you? I'm assuming it's the former. I'm assuming it's the former, but um, that's interesting. I've never thought to 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 find a book on tape about that subject. <laughs> Hope not. <laughs> Cre creative writing for dummies. I'm insulted. <laughs> I always did find those names to be, those titles to be a little offensive. <laughs> like, I'd like to think I'm not a dummy. I'm just uneducated on the on the on the topic. All right, um, boss key. So we're gonna make this like, um, so it's like maybe a pickaxe, but then like the boss key is like a shovel. So they can move like larger amounts of dirt, right, or something like that. Comes examples of techniques so you have a better understanding of what is considered good writing. Interesting. All right, interesting. I'm on board with that. I'm on board with that. I've I've never. This is the other challenging thing uh, about my streams and why I'm constantly saying take what I say with a grain of salt, um, both in terms of like, you know, the creative part of it and the mechanical part of it. I have zero professional training in any form of writing. My education has been in biology and chemistry. The last writing class I took was like grade school. So like big, massive, salt lick sized grain of salt with everything that I say. For me, it's like the, the creativity and sort of my experience just comes from the fact that I really enjoy sitting down and analyzing like artworks and stuff that are presented to me. like. I love analyzing how stories are told through movies, through books, what have you. Um, I love trying to analyze what makes a book a good book versus what makes it a bad book. You know, why did I like this book? What made it fun to read? I just, I enjoy doing that. So I spend a lot of time doing it. And 
honestly, if you just study something even on your own, after a certain amount of time, you start to sort of recognize the patterns and rhythms. And I just use that to produce what I do. And people seem to like it. So I'm like, fuck, all right. People enjoy it. I'll keep sharing it for you. I'll keep sharing it for you. Um, so the boss key, I'm thinking I'm, I'm going to make this a shovel. Um, and then for the standard keys, I'm going to do a pickaxe. So the idea is like for the places that need the standard key, you just got to like break down, you know, some, some thinner stones or something like that, or like a, a thinner stone wall or something like that, or make a doorway, an already partially open tunnel a bit wider. So the pickaxe serves, but then like for the boss battle, the, the barrier is a bit thicker. So the pickaxe breaks it down and then you need the shovel to try and like, and move it out of the way or something like that and again these are all things that players won't necessarily need these keys to get through they can like lock pick their way through by finding alternative routes and stuff like that totally fine i'm 100 percent on board with that but then if they have these tools it can be there this feels like a bit of a stretch but hey maybe it'll feel good when we get in there um and if not uh then well you know we tried not everything's a winner find out what needs to be seen like a dirt drill yeah something like that that's true like a hand drill or something like that like a large drill that makes a tunnel but it's like crank powered and so they all have to do that could come up with some sort of like clockwork gear steampunky type thing that they found there the hard part about that is like if it's big enough to be useful why wouldn't it be like already in place at the place that needs it in which case is the room really locked that way that's the hard part about it but I'm gonna I'm gonna take that into consideration. That's not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea just to have like some sort of like excavator, or maybe it's like maybe the key is like a spell scroll. Maybe the key is a spell scroll to move Earth. So it's like if they have if they have the spell, then they can lockpick it by just casting the spell. But if not, they have one use of it, and that could be extra fun because then it's like. If they don't realize they're going to need it later on, then they, then they're like, oh shit, we should have saved it. Guess we got to find another way around. So that could be, that could be a, a way to do it. Hmm. Room that has no exit, but the drill is already embedded into the wall. That's that's a possibility. That's a possibility. I don't know. I'm like, we could do something. You could do something like that for the standard keys. One use that way. And then, like, the, the boss key being the spell scroll or something like that. So, again, it's, like, a very specific item. But it's one that they could possibly misuse. I actually kind of like that idea. Just because I like the idea of seeing how crestfallen my players would be, realizing that they used it wrong. <laughs> I'm going to do that. We're going to do spell, scroll, uh, move, earth for that. So it's like they could just use the the move earth spell to to get past whatever the barrier they find is. You could do that. And then for the regular keys, for the regular keys, I'm going to go ahead and do like drill question mark, pickaxe question mark, and we can just like deal with that when we get down to uh to when we get when we get to this this uh, these rooms like, that'll give us at least at least one full stream to consider it <laughs> um, And then we can you know, it's gonna be quicker and easier than rewriting it copy and pasting it <laughs> Bada bing bada boom look at that streamlining the process Hedger group killed the guy They were meant to save by feeding him what they thought was a healing potion. They got from a dodge character. Oh, no <laughs> That's why I'm always that's one of the reasons why I'm always nervous about giving my players like trick spells that they at least as players don't have the meta knowledge of what it is right like I'm always worried that they'll accidentally permanently damage something I mean it's easy enough to avoid permanently damaging something when I'm the DM and I can just sort of like you know like add in a new alternative route for them or something like that but yeah I'm always afraid that my players are gonna do shit like that oh my goodness they are mowing the lawn out there. It just got real loud, even through my monitors. I don't know if it's showing up on the mic. Okay, apparently not. That's good. But, but yeah, so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put those little notes there because I'm looking at the time now, and through random-ass bullshit tangents, we managed to spend like a full half hour without accomplishing really anything <laughs> in this next layer of dungeon. But that's okay. We finished the first layer, and we had, and we had fun. We had fun, damn it, and that's the important thing. 
Um, with five minutes left, I think um, kind of with this consideration here and thinking about what comes next, I think this is actually a pretty good time to call it a stream. Um, I am going to be back. I'm going to take like a 15... Okay, yeah, no, you still can't hear. Sorry, the, the thing was going by and it was getting loud again. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't adding background noise onto my mic. Um, I am going to be back. Uh, and, like, I'm going to take a 15, 20-minute break here, um, you know, rest my voice just a little bit, refresh my beverage, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then I'm going to be back um, uh, and uh, for my video game stream, uh, uh, which we are presently going through Mass Effect 3. Uh, we're in the middle of a playthrough of Mass Effect 3. So if you would like more – so if you had fun with the tangents and anecdotes um, – the, the the video game streams are even thicker with that kind of crap. Those tend to be my much more rant, tangent-filled streams uh, because I'm spending even less time trying to focus on actually accomplishing something like I am with this. Um, so if that's what you're here for, you should stick around or come back in like 20 minutes because um, I will be uh, – yeah, you're damn right they're thick. They're, 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 they, they clap, that's for sure. Am I, am I saying that right? I don't know. But, um, yeah, so if that's, if that's what you're here for, you should stick around. If you're here for the actual D&D &D mechanics, I don't know why you're still here. Like, I would have given up on me a long time ago at the, the way the last half hour of this stream has gone. But if that's what you're here for, I will not be offended if you don't stick around. Uh, it's totally up to you. But that's coming up in, like, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, as for writing streams, uh, the rest of this week, as of right now, um, there's nothing getting in the way. I should be streaming. Uh, again on Thursday and Friday this week. No streams tomorrow. Tomorrow's Wednesday. No streams on Wednesday. Um, I have other prior commitments on Wednesdays that I am unable to stream. So, um, yeah, if you want more writing, uh, come on back. Come on back on uh, Thursday and Friday for that. Um, if you would like more discussion on homebrew type stuff, if you have ideas you would like to share, you want to pick my brain about it or pick a small community of other people's brains about it, I do have a Discord. We're kind of building a small community um, where a lot of people are sharing sort of the homebrew stuff that they're working on. Um, so you can uh, uh, so so you can feel free to um, join up with that. We'll get you verified. You can participate in that. Um, and then I also mentioned it at one point in time too. If you like what I'm creating and working on, I do have the VODs available both uh, for as long as Twitch keeps them up on Twitch. And then I also have a YouTube channel where I upload them. It's haphazard, not very well organized on the YouTube channel. I apologize. I only have so many hours in the day. Uh, but they are there. So you can feel free to check those out as well. Um, and with that, I think that's all my plugs. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for stopping by for the writing stream. Again, if you want to see more of me like blabbering on about stuff, stick around for a little bit. I'll be back in a little in a, in a short, short, short bit of time to do some Mass Effect streaming. Otherwise, um, yeah, take care of yourselves, and I'm stoked to see you next time. Um, either way, I appreciate each and every one of you. You guys are rad people. You make these streams so much fun. I have such a good time doing them. Uh, yeah, and I'm glad you're I'm glad you're here, and I am stoked to see you again next time. But yeah, that's uh, that's all she wrote for now. So I will see you shortly.